that, we'll uh, kick it off with Dr. Cash. Meredith, can I ask you to cue the slides? And Hillary, I'll turn it over to you to get us started. Okay. Well, I'm glad everyone's here. I'm glad I was invited to be here. This is a topic uh, dear to my heart. So um, let's go ahead and yeah. So why is this important? And um, I'm just moving the images over so I can sort of read what's on the screen here. Um, we all depend on screens. They are essential to our life. And with COVID, they have become even more essential. But along with, uh, <laughs> along with screens and the problems of COVID, uh, we are finding ourselves actually less connected than we used to be, and yet we're human beings who need connection. So it creates uh, a dilemma for so many people. Um, and anyone with addictive tendencies uh, clearly, this is a moment in time when they are vulnerable to uh, falling into an addiction uh, with their screens. So, so here, here's just a case study. I imagine you're a parent of an adult who got a scholarship into college. And, and this is uh, sort of an amalgamation of uh, our typical client at Restart. Uh, they tend to be very bright, but they just but they fail out of college. This is for our adult program. We all also have an adolescent program, um, and you're you're the parent whose child has failed out and is actually having suicidal thoughts. He's lost weight. Uh, he's socially avoidant, and you've. You've tried to talk to him about getting help and he's been refusing. And so what are you, what are you gonna do? And um, the point is that whatever your situation with a kid who seems to be really struggling with screens, whether it's this 15 year old who's become violent when you try to exercise some control over the screens, either, Either of these are situations which are dire and really require uh, attention from a parent uh, and they really should seek out professional help. So next screen. So the World Health Organization has, which produces the internet, uh, International Code of Diseases is putting out their new volume, the ICD-11 next year. They, it includes gaming disorder. The reason it is, this is the only screen-based disorder in being acknowledged is because the bulk of the research on screen addictions has been around video gaming. So this is what it is, a pattern of gaming behavior involving impaired control over gaming, which is like all addiction, increasing priority given to gaming so that interests in and, uh, and ability to engage in responsibilities, other interests, relationships, and so forth are, are falling away as priority is given over to gaming. And then continuation or escalation in it despite the negative consequences. And um, I'm gonna be talking about those negative consequences as we go. So next slide, please. The DSM, Five has internet gaming disorder as a proposal for inclusion in the future. They have, these are the criteria that they have proposed. Um, you need to meet five out of nine in order to uh, meet criteria. And as you read through these, you'll see it, it's really drawn from the other addictions. Uh, and so there's nothing really particularly new here. And it's, it's quite a different approach from the World Health Organization's approach. I like the World Organization's approach uh, myself. And, but I do think it is going to be gaming disorder by whatever title and whatever criteria they decide to use, I think is going to, I think, and I should say I'm hoping it will be in the next iteration of the DSM. 
So what are the influences? And uh, again, I'm talking to all of you. You probably are very well aware of most of these things. Gaming, of course, gambling. Uh, and gambling is merging with gaming. And it's something which I don't have an opportunity here to go into, but it is a, a really important uh, subject. It is a phenomenon that is growing. Pornography, of course. Uh, and so it, when I think about the clients who come to Restart, they are usually identifying themselves as gamers, but they are within games doing gambling. They all look at porn. Uh, they all have social media and they're engaging in social media of some sort. And gamers, those who I really identify as gamers, also tend to be really drawn to uh, anime and manga. Uh, manga is the written form and anime is the um, animated uh, and also drawn form. And they come out of Japan. Uh, these are stories and images uh, of a certain type, which are extremely popular with gamers. Random surfing, of course, we all do that, right? Probably at some time in, in our lives. And there's a strong overlap in the gaming community with some uh, antisocial sites. You may have, uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of Reddit. Uh, there are subreddits which gamers are drawn to and some of those subreddits are pretty uh, racist and misogynistic. Um, 4chan is rather notorious. There are also communities online which are pretty, um, really identify themselves in very misogynistic ways. So, and then there's the dark web. And the dark web is, uh, I'm sure all of you have heard of the dark web. Most of us never go to the dark web, but our very computer savvy gamers uh, often do know how to go to the dark web and have gone there and experienced uh, often some pretty traumatic things as a result of going there. Next slide. Um, because addiction falls along a spectrum from mild to severe, and it, you know, this involves the changes that are happening in the brain, in the pleasure pathways of the brain. When those pleasure pathways are overstimulated, the brain has to downregulate in order to, to function normally, that's tolerance. And when that process is starting to happen, you know, the addiction is mild. But as it goes along, obviously it becomes more severe. But because it can be mild, it can also be very difficult to discern. So looking for signs of addiction, and, and that really means signs of dysfunction, is important so that even if the criteria of addiction aren't met, um, those signs need to be those signs need to be taken seriously. And, and if you're working with families, um, they shouldn't wait until things have gotten bad enough to meet criteria for addiction. They should be nipped in the bud if at all possible. So next slide. So what are the problems that, uh, that stem from screen addiction? Depression is universal in the, in the clients we work with. They all come in depressed. Most of them come in anxious. The majority have uh, show signs of and often have the diagnosis of ADHD. All of these are, are common, the common diagnoses and about a third of our clients are on the autism spectrum. And they often are very high functioning, so they may or may not have ever gotten the diagnosis but they show those, um, they show traits. So um, what we see is that after about a month of detoxing, most, for most of them, the depression has remitted, anxiety is down, uh, they can attend and think better. And over time, they often, if, if, they're, if the ASD traits are traits of, inability to read social cues, just if, if they work with, with us or 
you folks long enough, um, you know, they can begin to learn those social cues and they appear less and less, uh, those traits of ASD might appear less and less. So we are always a little bit skeptical about those diagnoses. And if somebody has been uh, diagnosed with depression, but their screen addiction has never been addressed, um, and they've been put on medication for depression, what we find is that often after a period of time away from screens and getting sleep, uh, eating well, getting exercise, being social, that lo and behold, uh, they're not depressed anymore and they want to go off that medication. We're also skeptical about the ADHD diagnosis because if you've got a kid who's been, whose brain has really been wired for a short attention span and who has been overstimulated, isn't getting enough sleep, poor nutrition, so their brains are not able to create the proper neurochemicals, you're going to have someone who looks like they have ADHD, but the reality is they really may not have ADHD. And, and yet they, as a child, might have been uh, taken to a doctor who said, yeah, showing all the signs of ADHD, let's put them on medication. And then you're going to end up with someone who's addicted to speed. So we just tend to be skeptical. Uh, eye disorder is a term uh, coined by Larry Rosen, who wrote a book by that title. Eye disorder really refers to how personality disorder traits taken from various personality disorders tend to coalesce with folks who've grown up with screens. Too much screens, too early in childhood uh, can rewire the brain to create uh, a personality disorder that he's calling an eye disorder. The, the traits drawn from other personality disorders that we typically see are dependency, avoidance, schizoid characteristics, um, narcissism, and uh, antisocial personality disorder. They don't, most of our clients don't meet criteria for a recognized personality disorder, but they show the, this, this coalescing of traits together. And that's very common. And of course, um, other addictions if you've got, if you're working with somebody who is uh, recovering from a chemical addiction, let's say, or um, or some other behavioral addiction, they may gravitate. It, it's really common for them to gravitate to, to something like a gaming addiction or an internet addiction because it's right there. It's in their hands. It's easy and accessible and cheap, uh, very available to them, and it's you know, most of what's on there is legal. And so, um, yeah, it, it's really important to understand that that can be a real uh, vulnerability, somebody who's trying to cope with some other addiction. We see physical health problems, weight gain, weight loss. It's not unusual for somebody to have be 30 or more pounds, either underweight or overweight. It's remarkable to to watch somebody uh you know who's with us a long time start to put on the weight the healthy weight you know muscle weight because they're working out and eating well or or losing amazing amounts of weight just because they are living now a healthy lifestyle sleep is always a problem with the clients who come to us gamers very typically uh are not getting enough sleep, their sleep cycles are topsy-turvy. Uh, typically they are, they game until they're just so exhausted they crash. Um, and so when they come to us, it can take quite a while for their sleep to regulate. Um, I said conditions here, but I, what I meant is con uh, poor, poor physical conditioning, poor posture, vitamin D, Efficiencies. And there is growing research, and we don't have time to go into it here, but uh, electromagnetic field exposure can have deleterious effects on adults, and especially the younger a person is, the more those effects. Next, next slide. 
there are social problems of uh, primarily isolation, social, which leads to social anxiety, a failure to learn the social skills that are necessary to be successful socially, uh, conflict within families, loss of offline friends, um, gravitation to online communities where they're making new friends, and, and an unhealthy sexuality, something that we call an intimacy disorder. And an intimacy disorder really refers to someone who has not gone through the developmental stages required to learn how to build and maintain healthy, intimate, both emotionally and sexually intimate relationships. And so that's something that we always find we have to address with our clients. Um, you know, most of our clients are male, although we are seeing increasing numbers of females coming in. And, you know, you, pretty universally, they really do not have good skills for, for intimacy. Of course, we're seeing academic and work problems. Our adults have all failed out of out of college. Our adolescents have, uh, are starting to uh, refuse to go to school. Their grades are, are falling. And uh, job losses. Most of our clients uh, have, if they've had work experience, have not been successful in those experiences and have uh, been fired because they haven't shown up to work and that kind of thing. And as a result, financial problems. Most of them are dependent on their families to support them because they are not financially um, self-sufficient. Okay. So of course there are complicating factors in all of this. COVID-19, first and foremost, people are on screen so much more than they were. The family systems are problems. Um, typically uh, they don't have consistent rules, sensible rules that they are, and parents are often not working together adequately, uh, problems with communication, poor habits and schedules and so forth, the general culture of acceptance, uh, the lobbying efforts by these uh, companies that creates a political climate where it's difficult for uh, there to be regulation of the industry. And, um, and marginalization of, of folks. So I, do I have one more slide? I'm not sure I do. The scope of the problem is vast. Uh, research varies from one and a half to 13% of the general population around the world. Um, but with, with COVID, we're going to, we are already seeing a, a, a big increase in uh, the use of screens. That means there's going to be an increase in gaming disorder. And the sophistication of the games is, is just ramping up uh, can, and, and will continue to do so, and that is going to increase gaming disorder. Um, so the obstacles, um, you know, I've already talked about the, the first part of this slide, uh, but the obstacles are that we're finding that people are scared to fly for treatment, that um, parents and families are concerned about finances and that most of all, I think that addiction, which is growing, I am pretty certain, is hiding in plain sight because of all the screen use that everyone is, is, is expected to do for, for work and for their school and because people say, what else is there for me to do? So I think now I'm going to be turning it over to Jeff. Thank you, Dr. Cash. Hi, everyone. It's good to see you all. Uh, I think it's so important for us to be talking about this now, not just in terms of our children, our clients, but, but everyone who is experiencing drastic increases in screen time. I'm sure you are all feeling it. I know for me yesterday, I ended my day after about 10 hours of screen time, feeling exhausted mentally and physically. And what did I manage to do with my remaining energy? Sat on the couch and watched the show. So it's, it's, it's a challenge for all of us. We are living in extraordinary times, you know, mixed in with my Zoom sessions yesterday, work glances at my phone, work texts, personal texts, checking CNN, politics, 
the Breonna Taylor verdict, social justice protests, COVID, the economy. Every day is such an incredibly high volume of upsetting news and the technology and the media have worked to make sure it's as visible as possible for us. Um, so that's been hard for me. And, and I'm very aware of my tech use and have taken many steps to reduce it. What about our clients? What about our kids who are isolated and who are in pain? Um, you know, tech is seen by them as an extremely attractive option to feel better, but at what cost? And, you know, the, the negative impact can be seen not just in those showing symptoms of tech addiction, but all, all of us right now. So now more than ever, we need to be practicing healthy habits and modeling for those around us. Treatment before COVID-19, we had so many more options with, with treating tech addiction. We could take clients out of their environments where their screens were easily accessed. You know, school, treatment, those were chances where clients could engage with people and perform non-tech activities. Uh, treatment providers, we had greater flexibility in how we solve problems, whether it's restricting access to devices, options for non-tech related activities, those were much more widely available. Even, even for me working with a client, I could lock their device away in my office for the day or, or for the night and give it back to them the next day. Um, that, those options, I don't have those options right now. It's much more challenging. In-person groups and meetings with no technology involved, those were all much more readily available. Um, and then even if needed, there are many more options for residential care where that tech use could be monitored and restricted. Um, and then of course, treatment using screens for people with tech addiction would be the exception. I think we would only use that in very specific situations before COVID. So it's a, it's a different world now. In treatment now, obviously, lots of logistical challenges. Uh, even here, this is not where I typically work from, but if I was at my home office, you'd probably be hearing kids screaming and a cat jumping on my keyboard. So it's finding spaces where I can work and engage with clients as well as clients engage with me and have that element of confidentiality where safe, productive work can occur. And, and that's a challenge in itself. Um, you know, with fully virtual treatment required at times, possibly in the future, we're going to have to be really flexible with how we, we, we meet our clients and treat them. Um, I think with, with virtual clients, we probably have all seen, even in our professional Zooms at meetings, how, how clear it can be where someone's looking at their phone, looking off screen, taking a walk getting a break, it's, you're so easily distracted um, when you're not in the same physical space as who you're working with. Um, you know, I know I've had a group where it's a really serious process group and, and clients are working through things and I look up at a client and I can see in the reflection of his glasses that he's playing a video game. And, you know, all of these group norms and dynamics at play that are so challenging in general have a whole new layer that we have to explore. So developing a, a new set of group norms is necessary and having these difficult conversations about how can we navigate this a little more effectively. Um, you know, and then with some flexibility with in-person treatment now, we're having clients in masks. And what does that look like, trying to go through treatment with someone in mask, where you can't, you, you're missing all of that nonverbal feedback from their facial expressions. Um, we're also trying hybrid groups uh, with those that are either quarantining or isolated and don't have the ability to come into a group and having some in-person some virtual, using cameras, using that technology. What does that bring to the table in terms of the experience for those that are in the room versus those who are online? Um, really challenging to navigate. 
of course, we were seeing much more need for parent coaching and therapeutic work, not just because they're having their own experiences in their lives, but also having kids home from school, bringing up all these power struggles that hadn't been occurring for a long time when they were out of the house and now they're back in and facing these new scenarios together of course really challenging and then and then screens themselves virtually being so triggering for certain co-occurring disorders eating disorders body dysmorphia transgender clients uh, definitely have seen it with our hybrid groups where someone at home their image is um, displayed on the screen for those that are in person and client being aware of that and how uncomfortable that can make them. So just problem solving around all of these technological um, challenges that, that we're facing now. So some of the adaptations we've made that I've made personally is is really being aware of how we're ending our sessions and, and, and you know Sometimes with groups, we're in a conversation, things are going really well, and we're taking it to the end of the hour, and then they have to jump right into their next group. Really trying to avoid that, making sure we're giving them at least 10 to 15 minutes to get a break, get up, and, and modeling that for them and encouraging them. Because I think what I've seen so much is that when you're at your screen and you only have five minutes, what are you gonna do in that five minutes? It's so easy to go on CNN, check your phone. You're not getting away from your screen. So making sure there's more time for clients to get up, move around, even get outside, so important. Um, identifying and encouraging screen time alternatives, always looking for competing interests, making sure people are getting outside, exercising, engaging to the best of their abilities. Um, and even if it does have to be a screen time activity. So many of our clients, I'm home, I can't get out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be on my phone. What can you do on your phone that's a little more effective, a little less uh, bringing up negative emotions? You know, research showing that when a client is on social media, dating apps, games, those types of apps, they're going to be feeling worse than after than before when they started versus meditation apps health apps education apps even weather apps those apps you feel better after you use them so we're really trying to steer them to the healthier alternatives if that is the only option um, teaching proper screen etiquette i think has really been helpful just in terms of even before COVID, we were going to have to learn how to do video conferencing and clients need to do that for work. Now it's going to be a much greater part of our society. So just understanding, muting ourselves, what our backdrop looks like, what our clothing looks like, how we're speaking, what our volume looks like, all of those aspects to just make sure that we're adhering to it. It's a good uh, group norms, protocols, making sure everyone's comfortable in the space. Um, something else that has been so important is really implementing a lot of in-person events and sessions when possible, taking clients for walks, um, bringing our community together and doing a picnic in the park, opportunities that it's not easy, we're socially distancing, but giving us a chance to engage outside of the little box on our screen. Um, and then finally, you know, bringing awareness to our screen time, using apps on our phone, like, you know, iPhones have the screen time app, where at the end of the day, take a look. What, where was I today? I, I was on Safari on websites for six hours today. What does that look like? And then using the, the, the controls on it to, to limit some of those times, bring some awareness to it that after an hour an alert comes up, you've been on this for an hour. And then you have to type in your password to continue. Just bring up some awareness. Do I really need to stay on this website for longer than an hour today? And then, of course, increased uh, coaching, parent coaching and education that we'll talk a little bit more about later on. So this is, this is the focus of, of 
of my work uh, specifically and, and the research I'm doing in my doctoral program is, is really educating parents on the role of technology in their kids' lives. Um, helping them understand what the technologies their kids are using, what the games they're playing are all about. I mean, gaming has become such a massive industry and the games kids are playing are so engaging and there's such strong social components to it. Um, there's opportunities to problem solve, earn achievements, compete in a relatively low risk environment. So it's incredibly attractive to them. And parents have to understand what these games mean to their kids, um, as well as the other elements listed on the slide so that they can know that it's not as easy as just saying, turn that game off right now, go play outside. Um, you know, because as, as Dr. Cash was saying, the, the rewiring of our brain that takes place when you've been playing games for such a long time, your threshold for attention is really high. So to think that you can say to a kid who's been gaming all summer long, go outside and play basketball, go pick up a book. That is going to be so unappealing to their brain and so unexciting that they might try, but they're going to be pretty bored and then they're going to be kind of set up to fail. Um, so figuring out strategies to balance it out so that their tech use can be balanced out with those other interests. And if it gets to the point where their brain is so wired that they are not finding an ability to engage in those alternative activities, then what does detox look like? And how do, how do we make that happen that they're going to need that break for three months or so to really rewire their brain um, in a direction that other activities can be, can be interesting to them again. And, and that's where the, the boundary setting is, is going to be so important and, and where, where parent coaching is, is, is really necessary at this point because these are difficult times. It's difficult to have the kids back at home and now we're having power struggles, you know, having to identify the addictive tendencies and the behaviors helping them be non-judgmental, recognizing that, okay, our lives have been turned upside down right now. You don't have access to your friends. I get it. You have to be on social media. Or you're going to play a game with them online, but how can we do that in the healthiest way possible? Working through those challenges and just being flexible when possible. You know, and, and I think it, it's a family issue. And, and so it's really important to establish family norms um, around technology, setting up technology free zones and times. And then, you know, something that's been, especially for me with younger clients, I've worked at high school, middle school, and, and working with parents on the power struggle of getting kids to turn off games and it becoming really a means of collaborative problem solving. I use Dr. Ross Green's collaborative problem solving model of just identifying the parent expectation, clarifying the child's concerns, really understanding where they're coming from, clarifying your concern, and then collaborating on a mutual agreeable solution when possible is so important because they're not gonna see eye to eye with you and we have to do our best to see eye to eye with them. And hopefully you can come up with an agreeable solution. If not, if it's at a point where their gaming addiction has really set hold, then being able to support setting firm boundaries when necessary. It's my house, these are my rules, this is where we're at, stick to it. And prioritizing non-tech activities. Um, and with that, emphasizing role modeling, um, stressing the, to, the, to parents, managing your own anxiety. This is stressful for all of us. We're all having an unhealthy relationship with technology, or many of us. And how can we model healthy and positive screen usage? Um, that could be not starting the day or ending the day in front of a screen, establishing good routines, morning routines, like taking a walk, doing meditation, nighttime routine, calming, relaxing, 
promoting healthy sleep hygiene, as, as Dr. Cash mentioned, sleep hygiene is so important um, with our gamers and that they tend to be up really late on tech and it is, it's not gonna, make, um, not gonna make for a healthy lifestyle. Um, and then for ourselves, investing in personal self-care that does not involve screens, sending a powerful message to our kids. And because they're paying attention, they're paying attention to what we're doing. And here we just have, you know, a, a lengthy list of resources um, that I think everyone will find helpful and these will go out um, in our materials that we can send out after. So thank you. Thanks guys, thanks for that really important um, presentation on a really complicated topic given where we are in the world right now. And I love how you guys are giving a presentation about screen addiction and we're all sitting behind <laughs> screens <laughs> while listening to this presentation because we would normally be probably sitting in a circle or in a conference room. So it's challenging. Um, we usually at this point in time open up the floor to um, questions from the presenters. Um, and if you want to use the chat, feel free to do that. Or for comments, I see um, there was some questions submitted in advance. So I'm going to read them and um, uh, whoever wants to answer can answer them. So the first question is for older kids at home, during, uh, alone during the school day, how can we get parents and students to commit to a no tech other than school tech, i.e. Chromebook, the school monitors policy? Parents feel a phone, a smartphone phone is needed for the child, which is distracting. So let's start with that one. Jeff, why don't you jump on that first? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm, for, for me, I think that is the collaborative problem solving approach in terms of uh, identifying your concern. You're here, you're, you're home for school and school is your responsibility. And, you know, hear their concern. I want to take a break. I, I need to do this. Um, but I, I think that is a situation where you can direct them that this is, if you were at school, you would not be playing a game for an hour or doing anything like that. Um, so just coming up with some type of mutually agreeable solution to this, that at lunchtime you can use your device for a half hour, but other than that, it's after school only. And then if it comes to it, monitoring, I, I mean, right now we have such great access to devices, technology to monitor what's going on at the kids on the kids' phones, on the kids' devices. Um, so I think that is important to do if it comes to it and just bring attention to it um, and problem solving. You, you put the solution in place. If you're, if you're touching base and checking on them and you're seeing that they're not adhering to it, where was the obstacle? What happened? And what can we do next time to make it better? I think it's uh, very important to challenge parents who think that their kids should have smartphones. Um, it, it kind of depends what age we're talking about. Um, I think that uh, any kid who is younger than high school age uh, should not be having a smartphone. It is too powerful a device. It is, uh, and, and as an alternative, because uh, they are such status symbols now for children, there's something called a gab phone. If you're not familiar with it, highly recommend it. And the Gap phone can have uh, be a phone that absolutely looks like a smartphone but doesn't have internet access. And um, that becomes a way to maybe satisfy a child's craving to fit in and look cool enough, but, but protects them from uh, internet use that they're not ready for. And I also think that um, a child who's in high school, where you, if you decide that you, this is a child who is highly responsible, getting their schoolwork done, be, contributing to the family, not, you know, not giving you a hard time about the 
the rules and the limits that the family has agreed on, that's a child who, that you can experimentally let them have a smartphone, in my opinion, and, and then, and just let them know, you know, if, if, if it turns out that you're just not ready for that, that's okay. We'll, you're just not ready and we'll try it again later when you're a little bit older and maybe have a little more maturity. So. That actually segues really nicely into question two that came up, which is um, in essence asking, you know, how do we really help parents to be able to handle the discomfort of knowing that your teen is going to be really mad at you um, when you take away their technology? Um, how do you help parents <laughs> navigate that? Jeff, go ahead. <laughs> I'll have my comment too, but you, but you can start. <laughs> well, I was kind of hoping you could answer that for me because I struggle with that because I don't always know the answer to that one. I think it's hard. I think yeah. it's, but it's, it's okay. Like it's, it's okay when our kids are mad at us. Um, but I think it's, <laughs> they it's will coming. Be. They will be. And, and, I, and I think that's where, for me, it's helping making sure that you are understanding why the device, the technology is so important to them. And then you can come from a conversation of, I get it, I get it, but this is my concern. This is why this cannot happen. Like you cannot be on your device past 11 o'clock because you are a disaster in the morning. And that's the priority. So I think it's, being able to see where they're at and at least be compassionate when you're going through this process. Um, and, and hopefully that can alleviate some of the discomfort from the kids. And, and, and I really agree with what Jeff is saying. And, and the only thing I guess I wanna to add to that is that my experience, I've been doing this work for years and years and years, and my experience is that if parents will hold the line, you know, once there's been a conversation and the family has agreed on what the rules are, what the limits are, if the parents will be strong and hold the line, the kids come to accept it. You know, at first they're fighting against it, hoping essentially to make you change your mind. And so you have to tolerate their anger and their frustration and the names they call you and what they think of you and so forth. But later on, they accept it. And later on, on, when they are actually mature human beings, they are grateful. So it, it's like have the courage to be a strong parent. Okay, these are some good questions. There's a lot of them. I, I don't know that we're going to get to all of them, but if we don't, we can follow up with um, an email to everybody. Um, how do you guys think that being back inside more during the winter is going to impact all these efforts to minimize the negative effects of technology use? And it is, it's getting cold now. It feels like winter is around the corner. Well, you can always yeah. jump on, on Amazon and order all the warm clothing and rainproof clothing you need so that you can still get outdoors. And I think it's essential to still get outdoors as long as, you know, the smoke isn't killing your lungs. Um, so, I mean, that's one thing. And, and I, I, I know it gets more difficult when kids are saying, ah, I don't want to go outside, but I, I think that again, if, if the expectation is set that that is rain or shine, we've got to get exercise, we've got to get outdoors, even if it's just taking a walk or taking a jog or whatever it is, um, I think it's important that kids, I mean, it's essential that kids move. If the weather is so horrible, they can always, you know, you can, again, you can order it delivered to your house if you don't want to go purchase it in person. But, you know, you can have weights. You can, there are all kinds of creative, um, really good programs with a screen, uh, you know, YouTube programs or whatever. And the family can do things together, you know, um, Zumba or something. So I just think there are, Thank you. winter, you can still do it. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and alternatives, alternatives to, to screen time inside, puzzles, coloring, arts, you know, it's been awesome to see, like, we've been doing puzzles every night at, at my house, and we try to buy new ones, and they're sold out, because everyone's doing it, and the kids see mom and dad doing it at night, and they want to do them too, so I think it's just modeling other activities that um, kids will also be interested in. Mm-hmm. There's a question that came in about um, sleep issues. Uh, uh, the question is, is saying, what, what skills do you use to teach uh, or to help with sleep hygiene, basically? Many clients struggle with sleep, um, either falling asleep or staying asleep. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you help with that? Well, of course, at Restart, when they come in, they are away from screens for a long time. The worst client we ever had was someone who hallucinated. He was so sleep deprived, he hallucinated while he was awake. And he had been sleep deprived for years. Um, It took him six weeks away from screens before his body regulated enough that he could start sleeping, having actually having a night's sleep. So if nothing else works, just a, a, a fasting from screens for a good long time can help the body reset itself. And, um, and, and otherwise, of course, there are just the, the rules of turning the screens off an hour or two before bedtime uh, allows the melatonin to rise in the bloodstream, making people sleepy so that they want to go to sleep, having schedules and sticking to schedules, which in some ways is easier in the time of COVID, I think, uh, to sort of stay on top of that. Those are some of my suggestions. Jeff? Yeah, no, and I would just, I agree with all of that. I would, I would add meditation and mindfulness as like yes, the next good idea. piece, and, and, and especially with gamers. I, I encourage you all, I used to run groups with high school gamers, and we would, we would play the quiet game, and that was my introduction to them for meditation. And it's distressing when you are a gamer to sit in silence and quiet. Um, and so it's that distress tolerance that needs to be developed a little bit. Um, but it opens up that whole avenue of body scans and meditations. And it's such a powerful thing um, for them to be able to shut down and really deescalate uh, at the end of the day. Yeah. Parents of teens seem to be put off by the term addiction. Uh, This is with regard to anything, but particularly with regard to technology. Uh, Any thoughts on how to manage this this term? Yeah, we, we encounter it at Restart quite often. People don't like the term addiction. So Uh, Of course, you can talk about a gaming disorder, which is the official term in the ICD, but you can also just say, you know, unbalanced screen use, screen overuse, terms like that are just fine. What do you use, Jeff, when you've got a parent who's uncomfortable with that? I'm just trying to establish a healthy relationship with technology. That's that's what we say with our digital age group. Uh, We always say we're here to have a healthy relationship with technology. Um, this is a good one too. We see this a lot. How do you differentiate a gaming addiction versus a passion for gaming? Um, I have clients that identify themselves as gamers and would like it to be their career and are going to school for video game development. When do we discourage addiction versus foster passion? I think, so I'll just jump in and then Jeff can, can say his thoughts on this. I think that what is important is to think in terms of um, a pie chart. I find it useful to think in terms of a pie, sh- pie chart. So what does, you know, a, a young adult who wants to be a, a professional gamer, what does any young adult actually need for a healthy, balanced lifestyle? They need enough sleep, they need exercise, 
they need face-to-face -face social interaction. If at all possible, even during this time of COVID or you know, this kind of a Zooming experience, if, if nothing else is available, um, they need to take care of themselves in, in a myriad of ways. And then if they are, you know, and then if they want to be professional, they can devote eight hours a day or six hours a day to their craft. But it, what happens with addiction is that that wedge of the pie that is the, their craft, if that wedge is growing, it's squeezing out all the other things that are the necessary healthy parts of life that, that people need to be healthy and balanced. And so that's what you, that's what you look for, is, uh, is, is there a healthy balance of all the things that really all of us need. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I, that's an awesome image. I will be using that. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, but I think I agree completely. I think it's when you start to see when it starts impacting when there's negative impacts on different parts of your life, whether you're not able to maintain relationships, all the, all the parts of the diagnoses we've seen in the slides. Um, but I think it brings up a very difficult conversation because of the extent of the gaming industry now, these are career paths and these seem realistic to kids growing up. They're seeing people on YouTube making millions of dollars playing games, talking about games, making games, playing games competitively. So there are so many avenues that seem pretty attractive to gamers. And so I think it goes down to schools now being able to have those conversations. Is this a realistic career path? It's just like a kid saying, oh, I'm gonna be a professional baseball player. Is that realistic? And, and being able to have those conversations of what's realistic, you know, being able to build on skills that maybe a kid wants to be a YouTuber. Okay, what goes into being a top YouTuber that makes millions of dollars versus how about you just learn video production skills? Where, what, where can we take components that can be really valuable skills to learn that can lead you on a feasible path for, for a career, I think are really powerful conversations to have with kids. And, and asking kids to do the research uh, around what is the lifestyle experience of, of people who are trying to be professional. Many of them are miserable. And it, it can be quite a revelation and big eye opener if they, if they really find out, you know, like YouTubers who, are, who, who make a lot of money. It's a, it's a very rare person who does. Most of them are spending a lot of time making very little money. And, you know, just getting them to research it so that they are more realistic rather than fanciful about it. All right, guys, there's more questions, um, but I am cognizant of our screen time and what the time is right now. So we'll make sure to address some of these follow-up questions in the email that goes out following um, the presentation today. But thank you all. I know that John wants to um, close us out quickly. Perfect. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Hillary. Thank you, Jeff. That was um, a uh, extremely thoughtful um, conversation and, and I think one that, that certainly will continue in the, the weeks and months to come. You know, what, what I'm sort of, uh, what hit home for me is, is and also has been our experience that um, certainly there's been heightened anxiety around screen use, but you guys touched a lot on sort of modeling behavior for non-screen activities. And I think we're starting to see more and more that those types of things are bringing families together. Um, I think Jeff mentioned puzzles. I, you know, I think we're starting to see more and more that families are available to actually go outside and put on their boots in, in, in the weather with their kids. And what happens if you actually commit and take the time to do that? The likelihood is your kid's probably going to go outside um, and you can do that together. So um, I wanted to end on that note. Um, thank you both for that. Um, we come together and do this every Thursday. Um, next Thursday at three o'clock, we've been hearing more and more about this sort of concept of forced failure to launch. Um, as more kids are actually back at home, 
um, that we're actually quote unquote launching um, because of COVID, this, this idea of, of how being home, um, being on your screen is, is actually making it much more difficult to get back to that place of sort of launching. So we're gonna be coming together with Bill Brown from Confluence um, Residential Treatment Center on the Northeast to talk about preventing failure to launch. So you'll, uh, you'll be hearing more from us about that and we'll hope to see you next Thursday at three o'clock. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you, Jeff. Really great presentation. It was a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Johnny, if you're still here for all your help. Thanks everyone for attending. Hi, Ed. <laughs> mm -hmm.